I wanted to mention about that that I kind of did, but I, I wanted to mention it again. Many marriages have problems because of uh, there's one of my third drinks. Uh, many marriages have problems because of the wife's inability to, in, in many cases, it's the mom specifically, but some, I don't want to say that because sometimes it will be very much so the father too. Or the other side, the, the husband's inability to let the his mother or father, father go. See what I mean? And so what they'll do is they'll have this break of, breakup of authority where they'll kind of be united with their husband or wife, uh, but then on the other hand, there's this other authority in their life of the parents that they were unable to let, you know, transition authority over. Mm -hmm. um, and this is obviously not only the person's fault who uh, wasn't able to, because that that's very difficult to still respect and honor your parents, but then switch authority over to your spouse. You know what I mean? Um, but with that being said, sometimes parents don't make that very easy. You know, so it's kind of like, yeah. Those, those who are married, you know, we know what's up. <laughs> we do. Uh, and so what happens is you have these conflicting authority structures because you're submitted to your spouse, but you're also submitted to your parents. And this isn't just for married people. This is a principle that kind of stretches over to unmarried people too, where there's multiple authority people in your life that are like competing authority figures, you know. And sometimes you need to realize who actually is your authority and who's not. Your authority. Does that make sense? Um, and, and when you do, it kind of makes things a lot easier. Um, and I mentioned last week about how if you're over the age of 18 and are married, and are married, you shouldn't be living in your parents' household because what it is is your parents have built a house. They've built their family structure. They've built that authority. And you have left that authority structure and been united with your spouse. See what I mean? But if you stay in that, you're not able to fully – Detach, and so what's going to happen is you're not going to want to submit to them. They're obviously not going to submit to you because they're your parents, obviously. Though, uh, and then they're you're not you're going to start not liking their direction in life, and they're going to start not liking your direction in life. But it's not their responsibility what you're doing with your life, and it's not your responsibility with what they're doing with their life. So you, be, see what I mean? What you want to watch out for is you want to watch out for conflicting authority structures. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. And when you're living under somebody else's roof, it's their authority. When, when somebody's living underneath your roof, it's your authority. Uh -huh. see, see how that works? And uh, so when I, I felt like uh, as I was writing this week's lesson, I really felt like I, I maybe didn't make that um, clear enough, so I wanted to go back onto that. Um, so anyways, the question of the week from last week was how would you describe yourself in one word? Did anybody have time to think about that? Zach? Me, probably a loner. A loner? Yeah. Okay. Like you like being alone or? Well, just that I, when, when I'm in, like at work or at school, I can hang out with other people and socialize. But once, um, I, I'd rather, I guess, I end up like going, I can, I'd rather... Like after uh, school or whatever, I kind of be my be on my own. You just want to kind of unwind by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. You know, All right. Where I can communicate with other people, but then I prefer to be by myself. Okay. No, I understand that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Or anything else? If you had something else. Okay. Anybody? Maybe scatterbrain. Scatterbrain? Yeah, maybe. Oh, uh, why would you describe yourself as that? Because it's um, hard for me to decide on things that, like even just like picking what I want for lunch at a restaurant. It's hard for me <laughs> to decide. When I'm cleaning, I'm doing this and this and this and this at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. When I'm cooking, I'm doing the same thing. You know, it's hard for me to concentrate on just one thing and do it. And that's the word that you feel like describes you. Yeah? Okay. All right. Yes. One of the words, I guess. Okay. Was there something else that you felt maybe? I'd have to think a lot more. Okay. I'll, I'll go around and then we'll come back and see if you've thought of anything, okay? Nicole, did you have anything? Really, the first thing came into my mind is kind of random, but kind of twisted. Twisted? Just like mentally. You look pretty straight to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> because I think of things in such a strange way, mm -hmm. and I use different things. It, it's hard to explain. Could you maybe give an example or um, like I explain? Like if I'm watching a movie, I'd rather watch like the gory horror movies uh -huh. than the you know instead of a comedy. Like I enjoy more the twisted. Oh okay. Like it. It's weird. <laughs> Then? Hyper. Hyper? Really? Yes, it's still. We're going to do something all the time. Okay. No matter I what. can see that. <laughs> mm. You know, Diana actually washes her windows. Huh? By show of hands, who else here has washed their windows on their house in the past year? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. What? Nobody washes their windows. Except for Diana. <laughs> I watched it twice already. <laughs> See? It's only March. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, I think hyper is a good word. <laughs> you check? Um, I would say organized. Yeah? Because I, like, even from a young age, I, I hated having stuff out of disorder. Buddy. Don't get married. Boys or whatever. Just, <laughs> right. I hate not knowing where stuff is. I, uh -huh. The worst thing is when you put something somewhere and then it's gone and you all – where did it go? Because I know where I put you know, it. No, you didn't take it. <laughs> where did it go? But somebody did. Yeah. It's in that moment that Chuck pondered the devil living downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy. <laughs> Oh, man. I think I can relate to that one. I think if I had to describe myself in one word, it would probably be critical. You know what I mean? Um, everything with me is always about criticism. If I if I think of something, I have to think of a better something. I, I overanalyze stuff. I, I'm very critical of people. I'm very critical of myself. Um, and I think that's – in some ways that's good because it's helped me to, to kind of grow up here. Mentally, I'm able to push myself with knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also had a very negative effect, obviously, because I'm married and I have kids. You know what I mean? That's not something that you want to pass on to you. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, that's something that's good. Uh, you know, and, and then obviously as a Christian, um, I don't think that that's a very healthy environment to put yourself into, you know, where you're constantly criticizing yourself. <clears throat> My idea. Whatever. Um, okay. So did anybody else have anything else to say? She is? Do anybody else have anything? Uh, no? Um, okay. I tend to be a little uh, on the obsessive organization. Uh -huh. type. Well, they picked the right person to do the dishes then. <laughs> uh, I'm very, I, first thing I do is really organize the glasses. Yeah. Because I can't handle <laughs> things off. He's all in the kitchen. He's like, I know, I know it's there. <laughs> It can awesome. be a particular way, yes. Yeah. Um, even at home. Yeah. And with cold friend, I certain things could be. <laughs> son, you, 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 hold on now. You, you, hold on now. You, why don't you put that up, uh, son? Colt, come on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes their space being messed with, though. Right. Like those messy people. <laughs> They're always like, this is my are pile they, of mess. Are they like scatterbrained? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, yeah. But, uh, but, but, but. Are they hyper sometimes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes are they twisted? The baby here. Grace, I, we never plugged that in. <laughs> That's because she was too scatterbrained. Big spot. <laughs> is it, is it hard to plug You're it supposed in? to be organized <laughs> over the plug in. Plug -in is. <laughs> <laughs> it's either there or there or there. Are you serious? Well, that's not a very funny well, joke. Well, I'm going to do this then. Do it. Should we look into that? Grace, can you um, go outside your house? <laughs> Diana is waiting to give me a word. Just tell her I'm holding the baby and I can't get out. Please. There's somebody outside of my house? Yeah. Tell her I'm sorry. Who is it? Who is it? 
She said it was Diana, but she's Diana, so yeah, I don't know if it's like be Diana. an alternative it's Diana. It's my clone. <laughs> it's the mellow Diana. Wow. <laughs> I've noticed something else I tend to do, though, is like if I have, like on my iPod, all my songs have to be alphabetized. Oh, yeah. And I have oh, yeah. I have a couple of binders full of lyrics. I had to go through and alphabetize all of them because it was bugged. I, I, I like what you're saying, but here's where you got it wrong. The songs don't need to be out. Uh, uh, they need to be put in their in their in their CDs, oh. right? And those CDs need to be broken up by band with the pictures over the CD. And then by year. And then by year. This is absolutely essential. <laughs> My iTunes automatically does it, and so does. But sometimes it gets it wrong, <laughs> and you have to fix it. <laughs> Uh, Chuck, is there something you need to discuss here? <laughs> we need an intervention. No, because I fixed it. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so what happens when we don't accept ourselves or have low self-esteem of ourselves? Um, I think we start we doubt. Ourselves. What do you mean? Like that you just, I guess, criticize your. Your own self. Okay. Okay. What were you going to say? Um, I was going to say, I think you criticize other people as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Because, uh, especially if someone seems, comes off as confident, you yeah. feel um, even more self conscious that you're not mm. um, confident. You start comparing. You, you criticize them to make you feel better. I gotcha. <laughs> Is that something you do, friend? <laughs> just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Bobby, Bobby's got it all together. <laughs> Who's Bobby? Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's something a all wife right. would ask. <laughs> Who's Bobby? Is that Y or I E? <laughs> but in the country, you can't be sure of that. Sometimes they're flip flops. Um, any, any other ideas? Don't want to miss anybody. You. Uh have a tendency to close in. Okay. Yeah. What do you mean by close in? Um, right? Shut down. Okay. Yeah. All right. So like withdraw from people? Right. Okay. All right. I think it also um, makes it where you don't witness as much as well. Okay. Because you're, you're, um, you don't feel like you can do a good enough job. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that that's, a, that's actually a good point. In certain cases, some people, you know, turn to drugs. Uh -huh. Just try to just to try to fit. Uh -huh. Yeah, because when they yeah. when they're on those, they feel they like feel they're like more they're confident. More, you know. Yeah. And hence high school. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It happens in college and all throughout yeah. adult life too. I'm just kidding. Usually give bad relationships too. Looks like you're about to say something. Well, I, I think too is if we have a bad self image, then we aren't going to. We're not going to try to apply ourselves to anything. Okay. Because we're going to think, well, I'm a failure anyway, so mm. why should I? Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, we had experience with this with people in college uh, where they would say, you know, why get up your hopes? You're just going to – they're just going to fail anyways. Yeah. You know, good point. Yeah. And wh what is that last thing you said, Grace? I said you get a bad relationship as well. Mm, good example, but can you explain a little bit more just in case everybody's um, on the same page with you? Say uh, a girl has low self-esteem. Well, she's going to get with a guy that not necessarily respects her because he likes her. And mm -hmm. so she's willing to fall for anybody that likes her. Mm -hmm. And then even though the guy's bad for her, it, she mm -hmm. will stay with him because she feels like yeah. uh, at least someone likes me. Yeah, and then go from destructive relationship to destructive relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Good answers. Anything else? Stop me if you think of anything, okay? I really liked your guys' answers. Uh, we retranslate the Bible, for instance, uh, Song of Solomon. Um, this is something I, I, I very frequently get in arguments with people about. Very frequently get in arguments with people about. Because it's Song... Jesus' love letter to me. No, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I'm just, I keep saying the same thing every single time. Jesus doesn't have sex with us. What are you talking about? It's his love letter to you. And then, and then the person always says this every single time. Parts of it are. Well, that doesn't make sense. So you're saying a part of the letter is for you and the other parts you just ignore? And you call that God's word? God's word has to either be applicable or it's not applicable. You don't, you can't pick and choose which parts are and are not. Mm -hmm. And when you have a low self-esteem, you don't care about what the Bible actually means. 
you make it mean what you want it to mean so that it applies to your situation. Right. You know, and Song of Solomon is just one of the examples. You know, I'm pretty, Jesus said so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, we become unable to help others. Somebody mentioned this about witnessing. Who was that? Grace. Was it you? Yeah. I think that was a very good point, Grace. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's not like if what you said is not on here, you failed. It's not, no. <laughs> this is just some of the things, okay? Uh, but we become unable to help others. We be, uh, we start to we start to kind of cut ourselves off, and kind of tying yeah. with and with what and what Diana said, we kind of withdraw. You know. Um, we become so so focused on our problems that we can't see into somebody else's. Mm -hmm. uh, we can become bitter yeah. and then marry or date for the wrong reasons. Like like again, Gracie mentioned this, um, where we're we're bitter towards who we are, but that actually filters to God. We're bitter mm -hmm. towards how God made us. Yeah. You know what I mean, and so then we kind of we kind of let this bitterness be a driving factor to our future relationships and, and our and our fellowship with people, you know, and it becomes this driving force to our lives. Um, everything becomes a competition that proves our worth. Right. Everything is proving our worth. Our kids, they prove our worth. Our, our ministry, our job, our everything, everything comes back to us. Somebody will be talking about something and somehow you have to work yourself into the conversation. Why? Because you have to prove your worth. Yeah. Everybody knows you're worthless and so you have to show that you have worth. And then every time somebody else is going through something, somehow you've experienced this. Why? Only Be worse. Right, only, only worse. worse. Why? Because you, you have to be included in that. It, 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 because your self-worth is based on that. And if they don't they don't know how bad you've had it, they won't know your self-worth. See what I mean? It's all tied in that. Everything becomes a competition. Everything. Oh, my kids did this, and then somebody else's kids are getting attention, so it causes jealousy in you. Why? Because Not because it's your, your kids being overlooked. Because there's insecurity in you. Right. See what I mean? And just a side note, our insecurities always filter down to our kids. Yeah. If you have ins insecure kids, look in yourself and see where they got it from. Because more than more than likely, they got it from something that you do or you feel. Usually, not always. Usually. In fact, kids are, in my opinion, the greatest revealer of our sins. You know what I mean? If we lie, guess what? Our kids are going to be liars. <laughs> See what I mean? If we're jealous, our kids are going to be jealous and not share and that kind of stuff. See what I mean? Our problems will be transmitted to our kids. And when they're in them, they're going to be really easy to spot. So go ahead and spot them in your kids and realize how terrible of kids you have. And then realize, oh, I have those same things in me that I need to turn over to the Lord. <laughs> See what I mean? So um, – we make everything about us. This goes right hand in hand with the other, with the with the one before that about everything being a competition. Somebody be talking about something out of nowhere, and it'll just somehow you'll work yourself into the into the conversation. You can't just listen to somebody else, you know. And and think about this, for instance. Let's say as a profession, as a job, you are a counselor. How are you going to correctly counsel somebody if you are insecure? Because everything's going to be about you. You're going to read your situation into everybody else's situation. For instance, let's say you're a very prideful person, and then you're talking to somebody. You have pride in your life. Well, yeah, because the pride is such a dominant factor in your life, you see it in everybody else. Uh -huh. See what I mean? If you're gonna... Right. Our ghosts become their ghosts. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense? And we kind of transmit that. Right. So, uh, and I'll also, just this this is kind of a, a catch-all for all this. We handle, uh, We end up handling our problems very poorly because, you know, we're not able to work through these things. Mm -hmm. um, it, everything's personal. You know, it, it's it's about us. You know, Chuck, for instance, says something like, "I was gonna go to uh, the library today, but I didn't have a ride." Well, I couldn't give you a ride because, see, I mean, everything is personal all of a sudden. And he didn't mean anything by it, but for me, it becomes personal because I'm insecure. And you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where, where where you'll reinterpret everything that everybody else says to be the very worst thing that it could have meant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let's say I say, Zach, uh, did you work in that shirt? And then uh, let's say Zach is insecure. What? Are you saying that I look bad? See what I mean? You'll reinterpret things into the very worst meaning that they could possibly have. Why? Because you're insecure, and so it's being transmitted to everything else. See what I mean? So, um, <clears throat> how do we gain a proper perspective of ourselves? I think um, 
prayer helps. Okay. Asking, um, you know, God to help you uh, be more mindful of your feelings, Luke. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I couldn't. <laughs> I had no idea where she was going, guys. Good job. And then also reading the Bible, you know, where, uh, where God tells us um, that, you know, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and, you know, different verses like that. Uh huh, yeah. I think would help. And then um, also, I think, hanging out with um, <clears throat> friends that uplift you. Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, that's reading. what you were going to say? Yeah, reading the Bible. She cut you off, huh? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> that's okay. That, that, you know, and by being around friends that, you know, okay. uplift you and encourage you. And... Are you talking about those friends that, that, oh, I just look fat. And then they're just like, oh, no, honey, you're, you're beautiful. No, you're beautiful. No, you're beautiful. Are you talking about those friends? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Anybody else have anything? I'm going to say time. Time? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, elaborate um, a little bit? As you grow up, you mean? Or? Yeah. Well, that's to you, but um, I'm more mean on... on uh, Your own experiences. Um, I'll say an example because I, I okay. don't know how to explain. When I was, I don't know how old I was, teenager, teenage years, I guess, I don't know. Um, somebody told me I sing terrible. So That's mean. <laughs> well, you know, so I, um, I kind of stopped singing because, you know, this girl where she could sing and, you know, she could play piano good and, you know, kind of like... Well, if she said that, I mean, she knows what she's talking about, you know. So I kind of like, well, I'm not going to participate in choir or this or that because she told me I have a terrible voice. Ouch. <laughs> so, I mean, as time went by, I think it's just God working a character on that, uh -huh. you know. And, and then you kind of think, well, maybe she was jealous because not that I was singing good, maybe I... I Maybe she I wanted all the attention. Voice. I knew I had a strong voice, cause, you know, eventually, you know, of course, growing in the family. But maybe she was um, threatened, I want to say. Oh, threatened? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as time goes by, you kind of realize, like, well, you kind of, like, pick and choose who's saying things about you uh -huh. or, you know. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, where even if somebody is necessarily um, a friend or an enemy, you, you take more of, of what they said as as you kind of weigh it yourself. Is what you're saying? Right. Okay, that's what you're saying. Okay. Anybody else or anything else? Just kind of like based on the situation I'm in. Like I still live in my parents' house, mm -hmm. so everything I I do is constantly judged by them. Uh -huh. Oh, you don't need to do this, or you don't look going good doing that. Yeah. And it's just it. Really, the only solution is to move out and just kind of learn to live your life. Uh -huh. Learn to try to think of a way to put it. Build your self confidence by not letting everybody else get to Yeah. And see, that is actually a great example of what I was talking about. Uh, not really this week, but more of last week. You've got Nicole who's um, preparing to go off and be her, you know, separate mm -hmm. from that authority structure, right? Mm hmm. As as a, as an let's just a poor word choice, but I'll use it anyways. Independent adult, right? right? And then you have the parents who she's still living under, so there's that conflicting, right? Because right. she wants to branch out, and her parents obviously are still the authority over, right? right? So you've got this conflicting realms of authority, and that's kind of what I was talking about. Um, so that only leaves two two options. You know, the yeah, one is you continually submit for the rest of your life until they die. Obviously, or the other one is that you move out, and with that though you have to make sure. I don't know your situation, but with that you always have to make sure that you 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 leave with the authority on good terms. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that you still respect and honor them, even though you are still making your own adult choices. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm.
kind of a difficult balance to make. Yeah. The longer you do it, the more you get it. Anyways, going back to this, how do we gain a proper perspective of ourselves? Any any other ideas? Can you remind me not to forget about um, mentioning uh, what the Bible says? Can you remind me about that? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, so the first thing that we need to make sure that we do is don't compare yourselves to someone else. Or sometimes what people do is they compare themselves to who they used to be. That's still comparing yourself to other people, okay? That's, that's the same kind of an idea. <laughs> uh, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, excuse me. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. And then down in verses 17 through 18, Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. See the difference there? So, uh, that brings us to the second point here, by comparing ourselves to the character of Jesus. Obviously, if you say, I'm going to compare myself to Jesus, you're going to have some problems. Okay, he was a guy, I'm a girl, so obviously I'm failing already. <laughs> See what I mean? When we say, talk about comparing ourselves to, to Christ, we're talking about the character of Christ. That he was humble, right? right. Rather, than, rather than proving himself right, he died for, for, for those who didn't even ask for him to. See what I mean? He did what was right because it was the right thing to do. See what I mean? Um, and just just things like that, the character of Jesus. Um, would you change something about yourself if you could? By a show of hands. You don't have to name things. But if you could change something about yourself, would you? Yeah? Mm -hmm. See, we're all in that. We, we all do that. But here's the thing you gotta you got to pay attention about that. When we do that, basically what we're seeing is God's workmanship, how he made us, is inferior to our desired image. See what I mean? That's basically what we're saying is we're saying the way that I want to be is a better plan than the way that God actually made me. See what I mean? We get our own insecurities about the way that we've been made. Uh, too short, too tall, too fat, too skinny. You know, not the right hair color, not the right build, not the right character, not the right – I mean go down the list of whatever bothers us, you know. And uh, what we do is we, we're criticizing the one who made us. See what I mean? And that's what insecurity does, is it hurts other people without even realizing that we're hurting other people. It disrespects and dishonors God even though we don't intend to. Right. We're just speaking out of our hurt. As, count, as they tell you in counseling classes, hurt people hurt people. So, um, and then obviously from this, God is not fully trusted. You know, if, if, if you have something in, in your life like, um, you know, uh, you know, an illness or, or a handicap or, you know, um, something like, um, I don't know if you cancel, count it as a handicap or not, but like, we're, yeah, I think this is called a handicap, like being blind or being deaf, these kinds of things. And, and we kind of, we kind of criticize it and, and we hate the situation even though we can't do anything to change it. And what ends up happening is we don't fully trust God. So then what happens is later situations God will bring by to help us to trust him more. And that will either harden us or soften us. See what I mean? But God gives us the choice of either listening to him or of setting up a wall and saying, this is just not fair. This is just not fair. You know what I mean? And it's something everyone struggles with. So I'm not pointing fingers on this. I'm saying this is a fact. We do this. People do this. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so some evidences of self-rejection. I don't want to go too long on this. Overattention on clothes can be one because we try to compensate with our, our physical – what our, we feel like is our physical uh, failures or, or lackings. We try to cover it up, maybe makeup for instance. Um, and, and the Bible talks about this. Makeup isn't bad or sinful, but when we, try, when we turn to things like makeup be, to try and turn people's heads because we're insecure with, our, with ourselves, then it becomes bad. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Um, inability to trust in God. Uh, we reject the design, so we reject the designer. It's kind of like a, uh, I want to say a catch-all. It's just a, a, a cause and effect. You know, if we, if we reject what God has done, eventually we're going to reject him, or we already have. 
um, because you said that this is how I made you, and then we say, well, that's not good enough. <laughs> um, excessive shyness can be. These things are not always. I'm just saying they can be. Uh, what we fear, uh, what we fear, we see, even if it's not true. See what I mean? Like for instance, I fear that I'm ugly, so therefore I see that I'm ugly, and so, see what I mean? Even though it might not be true, I see that it is true, so therefore it is true to me. Just kind of something to add to that. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, like, if you look into a mirror in your dreams, uh -huh. what you see is how you see yourself, usually. Hmm. I so never if you that. see yourself as ugly in your dreams, that's what you'll see. You'll so, see what you think of yourself, not what other people think of you. I see myself in my dreams as a super awesome superhero. Does that mean I really am? I'm going to go hop off this building and see if it's true. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, difficulty loving others. Love ourselves. We have to love ourselves to love others. So people always ask, do I have to love myself? Do I have to accept myself? So many people have asked this. And, you know, it's sad when people ask that usually because it, it shows that – they have a hard time with themselves, you know what I mean? And usually when this question is asked, people ask it out of pain, usually. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Sometimes people ask for other people. Sometimes people just ask because they're curious. But sometimes when people ask this question, it's because it's something that they are dealing with, you know? And so those are always the hardest questions to ask because there's a difference between having the right answer and, a, and, 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 and I don't know how to say this, a good answer and the right answer, you know what I mean? Like, why does God allow suffering in the world? Oh, that's because of this. But oftentimes when people ask that, they don't actually care. Mm -hmm. They are going through pain, and they don't understand why. They don't want you to have the right answer. See what I mean? Or I should say a good answer. They want you to have that right answer that the Holy Spirit will press on you to tell them. See what I mean? There's a big difference there. Um, okay. Okay, so self-criticism. Um, this can be a big one. Uh we, we criticize our, our features, our looks, mm -hmm. uh, our abilities, our talents, mm -hmm. um, our, our parents, our upbringing, our situation. We just criticize things, oh, okay. which leads me to a point that kind of ties in with, next, with last week. If you're an adult and you are criticizing as a regular habit other people, you need to move on. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter if those people are your parents, your siblings, your friends, your enemies. It doesn't matter. If you're an adult and you are making habits of criticizing other people, there's a good chance that it's something in your heart that needs to change. But at, at best, you are being a, a, a gossip. So at best, you still need to give it over to God. You know what I mean? We don't need to make those kinds of just negative habits in our life. It's not going to benefit us or anybody else. We need to turn those things over. Um, are you Are you taking pictures? No. Okay. Um, some more wishful comparison. Uh, we live in a fantasy world where we see something in somebody else and we wish it was part of ours, so we go on these like daydreams and stuff. Uh, we dream about it. We, we you know, um, I don't think I need to say any more about that. Anybody who's gone through high school knows what I'm talking about. Uh, bitterness. Uh, our self-hate leads to resentment and resentment to God, which leads to just bitterness in how and how we treat other people. You know, suddenly that person, like Diana was saying, from whenever, how long ago that was, uh, instead of letting it go and growing from that, we hold on to it and just another thing that we store in our in our self subconscious, so we can pull it out and show how we've been wrong throughout our years. Bitterness, bitterness, um, perfectionism, where everything has to be perfect. Anything less. <laughs> anything. Less is just utter failure. Um, like if I wash my windows? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying being clean. I'm saying where the cost yeah. outweighs the gain. Where the cost outweighs the gain. When you spend more time on something than you realistically should have. See what I mean? Like, she doesn't just clean the windows. She cleans the windows. An hour later, she recleans them. Because there were still a few streaks, then an hour later she cleans them for a third time just to make sure. That's perfectionism. So I mean, cleaning the windows is that's a good idea. I I should probably clean mine. I'm not going to, but I probably <laughs> should. Uh, yeah, you see what I mean? But where the cost of what you're, how much effort you're putting into something, isn't measuring out to what you're getting out of it. <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> She's a funny one, huh? <laughs> uh, an attitude of superiority. Now check this out, guys. What happens is when we feel inwardly inferior, 
we narrow our focus to the people who are who we see as as just poor schmucks, right? And this makes us feel superior, and it also makes us appear superior. The most times, if not all the time, that you see somebody who looks superior and acts superior, it's because they've done this. They feel inwardly inferior. They feel like they just don't measure up. And so they narrow their focus of who they're comparing to to the worst of the worst. Well, I'm better than that guy. And they start looking down on people because of that inward they, – they don't feel comfortable with themselves already, so they narrow that focus to that, those people. So they appear superior. They sometimes feel superior. They sometimes think that they are superior, but the truth is that they're not. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because last time I checked, God made man and woman. He didn't make inferior and superior people. No. I don't remember that ever happening. <laughs> See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, we attempt to hide the defect. Mm -hmm. We see the defect as lowering our value, right? Because there is this standard of perfection that we have to meet to. Anybody who watches TV, you see it all the time. T uh, uh, commercials advertising certain things, how you can have the perfect hair, the perfect makeup, the perfect clothes, everything perfect. So you can meet this standard that supposedly is out there of perfection. And anything less than that means that you don't have as high of a value as that other person. If you're fat, you're just not very valuable. If you don't have... The right clothes. You're just not a valuable person. See what I mean? And what, what it does is it lowers what God has made us to the things that we have. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And Jesus specifically talked about this. Is your life not more than, than your material possessions? Is it not more than these things? Build up for yourself uh, treasures in heaven where the moth won't get to. Mm -hmm. See? And that, that's in, this, in, in essence is what we're doing. Our body, focusing so much on our body when... In 50 years, we're all going to look the same anyway. So. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but beauty is fleeting. <laughs> when you're 50, you ain't going to be pretty. You might look a little bit better than some other 50-year-old for a limited time, but believe me, when you die, you're all going to be eaten by worms. See what I mean? It's just not that important. You can't take it with you. Your makeup, your clothes, all these things that people think makes them so up here, it doesn't matter. Um, extravagance. Wait, hold on. Did I miss that? No, I did not. Um, extravagance, wrong priorities. Um, extravagance, distraction for self or others. We try to distract ourselves from what we see in ourselves, or we try to make other people forget who we are mm -hmm. by these extravagant spending sprees, right? Mm -hmm. Just by showing how wealthy we are, that we got to drive really nice cars. We See what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. These extravagant things to try and distract people and, you know, trying to get admiration from ourselves or others. I try to be glamorous, try to be, you know, the highlight, the, the not just I don't want to be just be the Barbie. I want to be the special edition Barbie that comes with the little hair, with a little comb and the special clothing and the, you see what I mean? <laughs> um, and so obviously wrong priorities, um, doing things for rewards, doing things for attention, doing things for fame. Obviously, if, if if we're so if if we have rejected ourselves, that's going to affect everything that we do in life. So I mean, to some degree. So, now any question on all on all that? And I I had um five ten I had twelve things. So did anybody have questions on that? No. Good. Awesome. Okay, so just a few insights uh, I want to talk about. God made us for fellowship with Him. John 10.10 10 says this. God did, God did not make us to be the prettiest horse on the pasture. You see what I'm saying? God cares about something much, much more important. John 10.10 10 says, um, The thief comes only to steal and kill and, and destroy. I came that they might may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life. See, God's focus isn't about those things. Yes, he made things with, with, with beauty and, 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 with, and with whatnot. But beauty is in the eye of him, not in the eye of people around you. Right. Not the people you went to high school with, not the culture, not, not, not what music, musicians say, not what, what TV says. Those people don't decide what beauty is. God decided what beauty was. right? And he made us as he desires, which means he finds us uh, 
I don't want to. I don't want to use that word. Which means he made us exactly as he wanted us to be. That's that's. I don't want to because I don't want to get tripped over grammar later on. You'll see what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, Satan destroy, uh, desires to destroy or diminish our potential. Dimi diminishing our potential is still just as just as good as destroying us. And what he'll do for this is he'll work insecurities in us. If you're not insecure with your image, you're going to probably ins be insecure somewhere with something. Why? Because Satan's always going to throw these little things out. Ever notice how you're just having a good day with the family, barbecuing some stuff, and then out of nowhere, your brain reminds you. Of that one stupid thing you did when you were four. Yeah. And so you take that poker and you just stab yourself in the eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Because it's something that, ah, I can't let it go. It's just so embarrassing. I'll give you an example of this. Grace and I were at school. And there's this movie called Operation Dumbo Drop. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you seen uh, it? Oh, okay. Yeah, and there's this part where they're on the bridge and they're, the, truck, the army trucks broke down. And... <laughs> He's like, because guys like you don't think things through. And he pushes them like that. Well, there's this weird – come here, Jack. Uh, Grace and I were dating, and we were, and we were walking and talking. And I, I just assumed everybody had seen this because, you know, it's funny. So I was like, Grace, because people like you don't think things – and then the last time I actually poked her in the eyeball accident. And every single time, this just brings back up in my mind. It's just like, ah, that stupid – you know what I mean? That stupid thing that you did is just like, ah, I wish I could take that back. You know what I mean? Those, those insecurities. We're going to have insecurities somewhere. So I should still marry you. <laughs> well, that wasn't even the worst one. The one I feel bad about. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not self-conscious about this one. I'm, I just feel really bad about it. We were in this, in the hot tub at the uh, wellness center in the, they had the, where you work out the pool, the steam and the steam room and then the hot tub. And so it had been a long day. And my muscles were kind of tight, so so I said, "Hey, I'm gonna go to go to the hot tub." And she's like, "Okay, I'll, I'll go with you." And so we go to the hot tub, and uh, I know AGers aren't supposed to be in hot tubs with opposite people of the opposite sex. I know. Look at the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, and uh, I was sitting there messing with the uh, rail that you used to get in there because you know it was loose, and I don't know, I was just screwing with it because I was antsy, whatever. And uh, it popped really far and smacked her in the face, and a piece oh. of her tooth goes flying out. Oh. Yeah. So I had to go and get a dentist to, to look at her mouth and to think that he was able to fix it. But I mean, I don't feel insecure about that. I just feel like, wow, that's, that's really terrible. Like, geez. Anyways, um, so Satan desires to diminish our potential or destroy us. And he'll do anything that he can. Do you know what I mean? Um, things that make us say, you know what? I am unable to do this because, you know, there's just this thing that I, I can't overcome. And we all have those things in our lives that we feel like we can't overcome. Diana's, for instance, she had to overcome what that girl said to her in order to join the worship team. See what I mean? Um, Chuck had had the kidney failure. Was that last year? Yeah, last year. He had kidney failure last year that he had to overcome. Uh, on top of, you know, obviously he's already in a wheelchair. I mean, geez. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like things that he had to overcome. And now he's uh, he's, a, he's a youth pastor now. See what I mean? Actually, associate pastor, but specifically over uh, youth and, and children. Uh, see what I mean? We all have those things in our lives that, that seem like big, glaring things. And here's the thing. We all have those things, and we all think that our thing is so big that it de indefinitely gives us an excuse. But here's the thing. You can either give yourself excuses, no matter how realistic those excuses are, or you can do something with your life. You can't do both. You can either focus on the problems or you can work at a solution. You can't have both. You know what I mean? So, oh, well, they said this when I was a kid or, or somebody – or my parents were so unfair to me or this happened or this happened. You can either sit there and blame, blame everybody else all day long or you can get up and do something about it. Do you want to do something with your life or do you want to throw it away? We all have reasons and excuses as to why we can't do something. Find reasons why you can and then do it. See what I mean? So, Satan tells us that God has cheated us. He did this in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, so, uh, what's that? Oh, that's just a tree. We're not supposed to eat from that. I don't think he meant that. You could be like God. See what I mean? He's always trying to tell us that we're being cheated somehow. That's the basis of pornography, right? Holy crap, I do bring up pornography every week. Uh, you know, uh, my spouse isn't attractive enough. My, I, I'm never going to get with someone. So, what do we do? A, a fake world. 
You know what I mean? We, we got, Satan always tries to tell us that we're being cheated. You know, our, our, our job is not enough that we have a job. We have to have the perfect job, a better hang job, <laughs> a job with people that we like more. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, our ministry, you know, ministry is whatever, but I don't like this pastor. I don't like this person. See so, you know what I mean? And everything becomes a competition for us because as Satan whispers in our ears, we're being cheated. You had the worst parents in the world. Okay, what are the statistically what are the chances of that? I mean, come on. Um, God designed us before creation. I want to read some from, from Psalm 139. This is kind of a powerful statement. Before creation ever was, God knew that He was making you, and He designed you before creation ever was. We're talking about before there ever was an Adam and Eve. He saw you, made you as you are, and this is who you are today. I'm not. I'm not saying you should never change when God's working in your spirit. Well, I'm just a stubborn jackass, so I'm going to die a stubborn jackass. I'm not saying that. Like, by all means, you should let God work in you. But I'm talking about, you know, when, you see what I'm saying. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Hebrews says it like this. You know my, you, you know me completely. You're, you're able to distinguish between bone and marrow, right? You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, the Lord, you know it altogether. You know what I'm going to do before I even do it. Before I even think that I'm going to go, go do that, you know that I'm going to do that. Mm. Think about that. When you're apologizing to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, forgive me for this. He already knew that you were going to, going to do it, and he already decided to forgive you when you apologized and asked for forgiveness before you even committed the thing. And as you're, as you're asking for forgiveness for this thing, he already sees your next time you're going to mess up. Wow, that's a powerful statement. You hem me in behind me and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is, it is high counter. I can't even explain this. I don't understand. I, I, it's, it's hurting my brain to think about this. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee, flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward part, you knitted me together in my mother's room. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me saw my unformed substance, and your book were, uh, were written, every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That's some powerful statements. Those are some powerful, powerful statements. So God is still working on us, and I, and I really feel like we should... You know, not downplay that. God is working in us. You know, we don't have to be insecure about things because you know God is working in us. We have to surrender to God, but God is still working in us. Okay. So what the Bible says about our image? Let's look at that for a second. I remembered. You don't have to remind me. <laughs> Genesis says that we were made in the image of God, and then when Noah steps off the boat, do you know what God specifically tells him? I'm going to require the lifeblood from anybody. Who, sh who kills a person. I'm going to require their blood from them. Basically, they're guilty of murder, and I'm, I'm going to hold them to that. And then he says this, because man was made in my image. Read through the account of the flood. It's in Genesis, I believe, chapter 9. They just get off the, uh, off the boat at the end of chapter 8, and, and God's telling them this stuff about the, about the rainbow and about how they can eat meat now. And then he, and then he says that. Don't you can kill animals for food? That's fine. But if an animal or a person kills kills uh, kills somebody, I'm not going to require their death, because man was made in my image. That says that God treasures us. Jesus said many things about uh, about treasuring us, but one of the things that he said was, "I have clothed these weeds of the field. How much more do you think I care for you?" No in the Bible though does it ever say that God is attracted to us. Okay, the whole Song of Solomon thing, it doesn't fit. Because God, attraction is a very limited thing. Do we understand that? Yeah. So we could, we could literally be dubbed in Time Magazine as the ugliest person in the world. Guess what that would mean to God? Nothing. Guess what that should mean to us? Nothing. Because Time Magazine doesn't decide who's the, who the you know, most beautiful people in the world are. 
See what I mean? God made us as He desired for us to be. Beauty is, is something that, that we look at and we judge others for, but it's not something God intended for us to see people's value from. Okay? So, uh, some more things. There is no universal ideal for appearance. There is no ideal for what, what perfection Are you going to say something? Oh, there is no ideal for what perfection is. It's not like, this is what you need to be to be the most attractive person in the world. There's no universal ideal. See what I mean? In Africa, they're looking for this. In America, they're looking for this. And You see what I mean? Uh, there's this movie called King Arthur. And it had um, Kieran, a woman, an actress named Kieran Knightley in it. Yeah. In the American release, on the billboard, they enlarged her breast size in her little skimpy thing, whatever you want to call that. Whereas in the UK version, they didn't. Why? Because there's no universal uh, – this is the standard of beauty. See what I mean? There, there's no universal thing in the whole world. Is Some people are going to find you attractive. Some people aren't going to find you attractive. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Uh, there's no universal ideal for appearance. However, there is a universal ideal for inward character, and God repeatedly tells us about the character, right? What does First Timothy say? Women, don't, don't try to do all these other things. Let your beauty be on the inside. See what I mean? Why did he specifically say that? Because our value is not based off of our appearance. So, uh, our happiness is not dependent on beauty, but experience with God. Some people will always say something like this. I'm angry at God because he made me ugly. Oh my gosh. Because he made me ugly. But here's the thing. Our happiness is not dependent on our beauty. If we were the most attractive person in the world, did you know that we're still going to find problems in ourselves? Mm -hmm. Did you know that... They did. They did. Uh, what are they called? Uh, were you? We asked people on campuses. Uh, quiz, not quizzes. Um, surveys. Surveys. They did surveys and of the most attractive people on campus, and 95% of them were unhappy with their appearance. And they only surveyed the attractive people. What does that tell you? Yeah. <laughs> what does that tell you? Our happiness is not dependent on beauty. Our happiness is dependent on experience with God, because that's what God made us for. He made us to walk with him. He made us to, walk, to have fellowship with him. So what do we do? We look for a perfect job, right? And you know that song, I'm holding up for a hero. That one? It's like, I'm holding up for the perfect job. We're not going to find it, though. See what I mean? Uh, we're never going to be going to be perfectly satisfied with our voice, with our with our appearance, with our looks, with anything like that. It's never going to happen. It's try singing a song and sing it till you feel like you got this down. And then record it and then listen to yourself sing it. And you're like, ah! Uh, That's a terrible singer right there. Why? Be see what I mean? We're always going to have something. Yeah. Um, so our happiness is not dependent on beauty. Um, and God will make no mistake of this. Okay, God will sacrifice outward for inward. God will do that. Absolutely. Because our outward is passing away. Our outward appearance, it's fading even as we're born, it is fading. As Chuck always said in his creepy childhood days, <laughs> I I'm dying. <laughs> we all are dying. See what I mean? It's all downhill from here, guys. Uh, I was reading this post from Christopher Walken, and you know what he said? None of us are making it out of here alive. <laughs> he was talking about life. But, you know, it, that, that's true, you know? And, and, and uh, So God will sacrifice a temporary outward ugliness, as it is deemed, for inward character. And in anything, God wants us to be uh, pure in spirit. That's what he's looking for. Okay. How many times do they talk about this? Peter, read first and second Peter. How many times does he say about you know, the, the inward character? Um, and you know, th this we were reading this in a book. Uh, I mentioned it last week. It's called Turn Around Pastor by Donald uh, – Don Ross. Don, Don Ross. Yeah, Don Ross. And he said, God has no problem – with placing a pastor at a church where they are unhappy for 10 or 20 years for the well-being of his kingdom. He has no problem with asking 10 or 20 years of your life. Because it's not all about us. See that? God's trying to work something in us. God's trying to, trying to do something. And God will sacrifice for the greater good of you. Your greater good. Um, so... Uh, a few other things. Differences are good. It's good that we don't all look the same. It's good that you know that some people are fat, some people are skinny, some people are this, some people are that. You know that's a good thing. Um, obviously, you know uh, there's extremes. People who are too skinny and so their body is is not functioning correctly, or people who are too heavy and they need to lose weight. Obviously, I'm not talking about stuff like that. But you know we do all have different builds and you know, that kind of stuff. So.
uh, God's reputation is at stake by what we do. Okay? Do you understand this? If God makes us, and we're a Christian, we do nothing but complain about the image, God is still God. But how other people are going to understand God will have been scarred. See what I mean? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Exodus 4, 11 through 12, and obviously God doesn't need our approval. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we may have potentially harmed God's you know, work in somebody because of this. Exodus uh, 4, 11 through 12 says, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or, uh, or sing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. What did you just say? I made the blind. I made the deaf. I I made people. Don't worry about it. I got this. <laughs> I got this. Um, so correct what you can. And when I say correct what you can, I'm not talking about go have surgery. That's not what I'm talking about at all. You might not like your nose. Uh, it, that, that, whatever. You, just accept yourself. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. I don't like the way I look. Well, so buy yourself an, uh, some new clothes and then, you know, look better. Right. Better. And see what I mean? I'm not talking about going into surgery. Um, uh, and glory in what you can't. These are the things like, I don't like my nose. Well, don't get a surgery to fix it. Glory in that. That's who God made you. Right. That's your uniqueness. I don't like my body. That's your uniqueness. God made you like that. See what I mean? When we start turning the bad traits into positive traits, I heard it like this on the radio. There was a mom who said to her kid when, when, when they would see somebody who was like a handicap, for instance, and they would say, Wow, that's neat. What opportunities do they have to use that? See what I mean? Like, I'll give you an example of a guy who did this. There's this guy. You've probably seen him on, like, TBN if you've watched it. He doesn't have arms or legs. Wait. Yeah. 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 He, he looks like just a torso with a head. And uh, he do, he uses it for great – he uses it for God's glory. I'll show him. Yeah, he'll, he'll pull up a picture. He's using it for God's glory. How cool is that? See what I mean? So don't look at things as – you, you look at it as an opportunity. How can I use this? See what I mean? How can I use this? Um, and then uh, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Nick. The, yeah, Nick. The Suchi or whatever. Talking about the guy without legs and, and arms. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, um, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. Except for you ugly people. No, you were bought with a price. <laughs> See what I mean? Right. Um, so some people say, why does God allow this? There is no ideal. There is no ideal. God made you as he made you. In fact, one part of, of, of the prophet says, can, can, can the clay say to the potter, why have you made me like this? Right. See what I mean? So, um, or some people take their frustrations out on man. God didn't do this. Man did this. You know, I, I had a acid spilled on my face. I don't know, whatever. Uh, man cannot change God's plans. God knew that that was going to happen to you. God, God knew. Remember what I said? God counted all your days before you even were created. Remember that? So, um, so use use your uh, insecurities, those things like that. Use them to mature and use them to serve people. See what I mean? Use them. Use them to learn from. Um, and we're, we're going to just wrap up here real quick. I'm just going to shoot through these things. So if you have any questions, you just wave me down, okay? Um, focus on the positive aspects. I already mentioned that. Thank God for who he has made you. Instead of complaining to God, turn it into a blessing to God. Thank you, God, for how you've made me. See what I mean? And that's difficult. That's a full-time job. There. It takes Sometimes it takes us years to do this. Um, allow God to work character in you. Allow it to be something where, where you're submitting to God. Lord, I don't... I don't like this. I voiced that. But this is how it is. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. And then just turn it over to God and let him work character in you through the process. Um, be about the kingdom emphasis, not your own. Jesus didn't come to the earth preaching, hey, get a manicure. He came to the earth saying, the kingdom is here. See what I mean? It's about that perspective there. So be about the kingdom emphasis, not about your own emphasis. 
And as we um, as we do things God's way, we gain happiness. That's how we're going to actually become happy, is by accepting God's ways, accepting God's plans, and moving in that direction. So um, I have a few things that I already kind of mentioned. God is not attracted to us. We already mentioned this. Song of Psalms is not from God to us. It is, it is, it is a love poem. It teaches us things like that. Uh, uh, beauty is fleeting. Now get this, guys. I don't know. I don't know why I didn't see this when I was a kid. We hit our prime of appearance at like what, 18 maybe? On average, some people are late bloomers. Sometimes people are early bloomers, but we hit about 18. And we pretty much start going, you know, where we start do, needing to do more maintenance to keep our appearance by about 25. Mm -hmm. And then by 30, it becomes more obvious. You know, wrinkles start appearing, hair start graying. By the time you're about 40, you start seeing the transition to middle life. By the time you're 50, you're in middle life. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you got gray hairs. Maybe you're already, you're, you're either have already started to become bald, or you are bald. So I mean, or if some people just have thick hairlines, curse you. <laughs> but, you know, because of this. Uh, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Uh, you know, so th that means at best we have 18. Let's say you're really attractive, 18 to 40. You've got 22 years of attraction, and then it's all downhill, guys. Honestly, don't give this that big of a hold on your life where if you think you're physically unattractive, it becomes life-dominating. Beauty is fleeting, guys. It is. We're not going to get to heaven and God's going to say, you died as the prettiest person. You get to sit next to me. You know, it's not going to matter. <laughs> it's not going to matter at all. Um, inside is what is important. I know that's what people always tell the ugly people, but honestly, it is true. The inside is what is most important. There was uh, Bible stories we used to listen to growing up, and they were talking about beauty on one of them. And one of the guys says, beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes clear to the bone. <laughs> 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 That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> All in favor of that being recorded? Good, because it's been recorded. Uh, value is not attached to looks. You are valuable because God made you valuable, not because you are the most attractive or least, or least attractive. That's just how it is. And uh, we need to accept that. Accept yourself as you are. Strive to grow. Strive to grow, but accept yourself. This is who I am. See what I mean? How do you do that? God, you made me like this. God, I see that I'm impatient. I pray you'd work work patience into me. Help me to be to handle these situations better. Accept yourself, but strive to grow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, this is something I wanted, wanted to mention, and we're, I think we're close with this. You have to watch out because our culture has an avoidant spirit. What that means is, don't deal with it. Run from it as much as you can. And I'll give you some examples. First off. Emotions reign supreme. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, so I'm going to get a sex change. See what I mean? An avoidant spirit. Rather than acknowledging God, this is how you made me. I don't understand why I feel like this. I don't understand why I look like this. You made me like this, though, so I'm going to seek you through it. Rather than that, it becomes an avoidant spirit. Run from it. Don't acknowledge it. I can be a boy or a girl if I want to be a boy or a girl. See what I mean? Not dealing with the fact of this is how it is. Um, and so discomfort is always fleed from. The Bible talks again and again about enduring, enduring, enduring. But the world, our culture doesn't tell us that. It says flee from discomfort. Run from it! Uh -huh. <laughs> See what I mean? Um, we get sex changes. Uh, we, cha we, we try to change it. We don't like, I don't like my nose, so I'm just going to get a new, new nose. I want Marilyn Mon Monroe's nose. Said nobody ever, but you know, let's just say some hypothetically someone did say that. So um, does everybody kind of understand that? Mm -hmm. Our culture kind of works counter God, yeah. and you have to kind of undo the things you've been taught from a child, <laughs> because it's all around you and it's always being poured into you. And if only there was some way, something that God could have poured out from heaven that would just help us to to get that. <laughs> yeah, the Bible. We need to stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. These are the things that are going to keep us from that. Um, so just some questions that I want you guys to, to consider. This is not the question of the week. This is just some things I want you to, to think about. Um, can you be told what to do? When somebody tells you what to do, are you instantly pissed off at them? When somebody tells you what to do, are you instantly trying to tell them why that idea is stupid? Can you be told what to do? 
Second, what do you do when you're criticized? Do you instantly fall apart? Do you blow up instantly? Do you see what I mean? What what is your first reaction when, when you're criticized? You you are oh, up inside, but you've learned to keep your mouth shut, but still inside you're like, oh, I hate you. I'm just not saying it. See what I mean? Yeah. What do you do when you're criticized? Yeah. Do you fall apart anytime anybody says anything, even if it was unintentionally harmful? Somebody accidentally hurts your feelings, doesn't even realize that they hurt your feelings, and you just fall apart. They don't think I'm pretty. I don't care. Whatever. You know, they don't think I'm, 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 you know, whatever. So I mean, what, 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 what happens? Do you, do we fall apart when people do stuff like that? These are just questions to think about. Okay, um, I'm not gonna ask you about. These are for your own benefit. Um, so the question of the week is: Can you be an American patriot and a Christian? Can you be an American patriot and a Christian? Hard question, but I want you guys to think about it. What? Can you not? <laughs> <laughs> those pe those Christians in China, they're not Christians. <laughs> Um, America. Don't answer yet. No, 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 not that. Oh, okay. Uh, when I was, it was with the, uh, what Diana has said, uh, from her teenage years. Uh huh. Um, something similar happened. A girl came to me when I was fourteen, told me that I was a boyfriend material. Ouch. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I can yeah. flex. <laughs> but it, it kind of, you know, didn't want me. I was very concerned, yeah. or you know, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't date. I didn't, you know. You know when something really hurts you, when you remember it. Yeah. When that, you remember it. And it was kind of where, and I, uh, where to the point that, you know, I just didn't care whether, you know, to date anybody to, you know, and then my mom, oh, one day you're going to get married, and I'm just, like, looking at her, and in my mind, no. yeah, okay, whatever, nobody's, you know, I had that mindset that nobody's, you know, out there, you know. Growing up, I always had this mindset that I was the most attractive guy out there, and that any girl would be lucky to get me. I'm not joking. And so as a result, uh -huh. I never treated any, any of my girlfriends with respect. I always treated people like crap. Seriously. It took me a long time as a married husband to learn. I'm not appearing bases down here. We're like this. Yeah. That took me a long time to learn. I was so full of myself, I didn't see that. I'm being serious. Yeah. So maybe it's not that bad of a thing. Oh, you yeah. never know. Yeah. Words hurt. Yeah. But I just kind of stuck with me. Yeah. Especially at you know, yeah. that age. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. You know. When we're <clears throat> in, when we're in our teens, it seems like we're, we're more receptive to anything else. Right. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? My back is sweaty, which is why I'm not sitting back down. I'm not trying to rush <laughs> that. Not in the first place. Well, because well, I don't like it when the fan's on with the lights on because it does this little spinny thing and it just distracts me and then I zone out and I don't want to just zone <laughs> out. It's lost in the... Don't judge me. It gets lost in the... You can't judge me. The baby's sweating like crazy. 